Start with a daily graphic. Oh, and just to let you know that we'll be joined shortly by Duncan Amwa, uh, Executive Secretary of COPEC. He'll help us dilate on some of these all-important matters. Back to the Daily Graphic newspaper. Block funding to insurgents, Vice President charges West African states. That story on page 16. Let me give you some details. Of course, you followed the trajectory of um, uh, coup d'etats in the sub. Lower financial resources to criminals who cause terrorism and political insurgents in the sub-region. He said the rising spate of coup d'etats, uh, terrorist activities and other acts of instability in the region in recent times called for increased efforts to plug uh, the loopholes and deny the perpetrators resources to help end the menace. Just uh, a quick point, though, in dealing with insurgent activity or terrorists in different parts of the world, like I say, the world, it has not necessarily worked. Uh, we have bilateral relations or relations between countries. And while in our economic community of West African states, the states may not funnel resources to them, are there other parties, interested parties, that can funnel resources through that this entire directive, or at least this approach, works? But if we just uh, look at it from the, the, the intergovernmental angle, it just might be problematic. Well, another story, unitization dispute, ENI vital yet to carry out court order. And this has been in the papers for so long, it's becoming, uh, I'll give you some snippets of that. So the lead operator of the Sankofa oil field, ENI Ghana Limited, and its partner, Vital Upstream Limited, are yet to carry out an order by the Accra High Court to pay 30% of revenues realized from the sale of crude oil from the field to the court for preservation. On January 24 this year, the court ordered ENI and Vital to pay 30% of the revenue accumulated since June the two companies and an indigenous Ghana oil company, Springfield Exploration and Production Limited. It is estimated that the 30% to be paid by ENI and Vital for preservation amounts to about $40 million monthly. That's what we're talking about, $40 million. And they are not, the not regressive. And this morning, we'd really love to hear from you because we're going to be talking about the E-Levy when we hit our big stories. As I've told you week in, week out, we shall talk about it. It has come to stay, the discourse on, on it. But the point to be made is, is it good for Ghana? Is it not so good for Ghana? Where do we find ourselves? Taxes, every country gets levied and taxed. But in our particular instance, the aversion to it, is leadership aware of it? Are they sidestepping it and maybe look at in the future? Or is it something that we ought to scrap completely? I mean, so many angles to look at. But in this instance, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata has been assuring the public that it is not retrogressive, but a comprehensive system to get all potential taxpayers to contribute their quota to national development. He said the rate of that the tax was pro-poor and therefore not regressive. So those are some details uh, in there that you can uh, take a look at. Uh, the story is on page three. Let me say a very good morning to Duncan Amwa, who now joins the conversation. Duncan, good morning. Morning to you and uh, to your working weekend. But here we are, it's a Monday morning, and we're doing what we do best. I, 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 I don't know how yours was, though. You sound a little um, low this morning. Let me just put it that way. Hope you slept well. Well, Ben, myself and George, we are fair, almost always enjoy. Uh, uh, I enjoyed mine the Saturday, and it's been a long weekend. <laughs> I see. Oh, so Duncan, you've been chilling without me, because I do recall giving out shouts to uh, George Biafé on Friday. So yours was following, and, and you had spoken to me just, I think, the day... Oh, it, will, it, will, it will certainly come again, but uh, we'll, chill, we'll chill with yours as well. Are you... Yes. It, it would be a pleasure to chee with the big boys, like... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there will just not be any running kitty kitty or kata kata. Uh, but, your question, but interestingly, and I put this out there on social media, on Friday, was it? Friday, I think. I went to the fuel pump and I was just taken aback. You know why? Apart from all the increments that we've seen in recent times, the, the brand of fuel that, or the type of fuel I purchase, I don't want to mention which specific, uh, Duncan, I went there last week, just a week later, and it was 8.16. And 
I really didn't know what to do. It just hit me and, and I was um, infuriated. Just the, the day before or so in that particular week, I'd interacted with, even as a member of parliament, he was feeling the pinch. Realistically, how do we deal with this situation? Because I think for me, it's getting out of hand. Well, Ben, um, gone were the days we would have quickly rallied to uh, power pressure on the NPA and all price in a little better now. Uh, where I can safely uh, look at is the finance ministry. Uh, if you want a decisive conversation or any decision taking as far as fuel price and, and the economics around it is concerned, it should be coming from the finance ministry. And uh, I don't know if you've seen a story during the round the weekend. Um, you could pile it on petroleum and all of that. Um, I the, the, that if what? That, just to get clarity, if the e-levy fails, it will be piled they, on to petroleum yes, products. If they fail to get the e-levy piled, right. um, he could get to petroleum to raise that revenue. Mm. <laughs> um, I'll be glad to share the link with you, but that's one story that has done around the weekend. And uh, almost every individual reality the reality being that people are really complaining about fuel prices and uh, what they expect is some action uh, to bring it down. Sadly, it looks as though those who should be doing uh, that sort of work are themselves are not buying. So while then you drive to the pump, uh, you would have to take money out of pocket to pay for fuel in order to be able to go about your normal day. And mm. uh, that probably would explain why we are where we are. Those who would have to take the very hard decision, uh, in this instance, uh, the Ministry of Finance, <laughs> are simply focused on a certain e-levy. And um, as though without the e-levy, um, um, Nothing else would move. And then the next option is that if E-Levy doesn't also work, allegedly, from the story I read, and others have circulated um, the weekend, uh, if E-Levy doesn't come, then we'll probably go for fuel, more more taxes on fuel, when Ghanaians are already complaining. So the cycle Duncan, so doesn't what, what, look like what, what, what any, any your... time soon, Ben. Right. It doesn't. Very briefly on this, what do you think the impact would be if the E-Levy doesn't go through and they slap these taxes on petroleum products. What do you think that would mean? I mean, you look across the board, and it's 7 point something, 7.6, 7.9, 8.1 in my case. What do you think it would mean? Any time fuel prices go up, it has a direct impact on both government and non-government, you know, um, institutions, agencies, and individuals. Uh, sadly, those within the governmental bracket, um, I interacted with some police officers um, over the weekend, and the same complaint. Duncan, you guys should do something about fuel prices because when we park the police car and go for our individual car, <laughs> it is not funny. You put in a hundred cities, it's gone within... Uh, three, four hours, you put in any amount of money and you would, the government would only realize how badly not mitigating the increases uh, has been to it only at the end of the accounting year. And so for now, for those chief directors who would probably take 100 gallons uh, a month or 200 gallons uh, a month, for them, it is stated in gallons. So if a gallon was costing four to this seventy, and they deserved a hundred, right. that is four, four, four in order to keep those officials running. And right. I have said this: that until the state come to a realization that overtaxing fuel prices, mm. taking all the money in the name of revenue, would only hurt the state itself eventually. Uh, like I indicated just a year ago. 
you thought you were taking in all the revenue, especially from our windfall uh, um, sales that we made on the international market because crude prices had shot up from the 60 uh, per barrel the, the, prevailing, the previous year but to cushion the system. Sadly, we took all those money thinking that we're making revenue uh, um, savings or whatever. But eventually, you have to move your budget uh, expenditure line from $97 billion to 137 just a year on. It tells you everything goes off uh, um, your projected economic, you know, bit. Now inflation is almost 14. Things are getting bad. Sadly, those responsible for managing it will not see the impact now because they themselves may not be taking money out of pocket to pay for it. But what it means is that the fueling of police vehicles across the country would cost a lot more. The fueling of the military patrols across the country will cost us a lot more. The fueling of our judicial service system would cost us a lot more. The fueling of ministry department agencies will cost the state itself a lot more. Okay. This is something the finance ministry ordered. Think about the impact of these increases on the state as well, because eventually your chief director, who you need to provide fuel for, you would pay more if you are buying from uh, any of these oil marketing companies, because the state itself right. doesn't have a bunker. <laughs> It's been, unfortunately. And, 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 and these are matters we're going to have to grapple with. But let's quickly uh, wrap with the Daily Graphic, looking at some other stories, uh, Duncan. Uh, NIA opens registration uh, centers at Accra Tamale. Uh, ben, sadly, I haven't received mine yet. And mm. I think that um, this step is very progressive. It is uh, something that the NIA should have undertaken long ago right. in order that a lot of the Ghanaian population could at least get a fair chance of getting the Ghana card. Now, you drive to the NIA head office, right. and oftentimes the queue that you meet there would either say go and come back another day, but the, another day would also be met with public spaces where people can walk in freely, uh, be able to prove that, indeed, I merit the card, and mm. be able to get that service extended. Some are even willing to pay for it, yet the premium service is currently also, I mean, under the kind of pressure that the normal service is also, I mean, undergoing. So that service would need to be looked at, especially if you look at the fact that we are now saying that without the Ghana card, you cannot even register your chip, right. and your SIM would also be taken away from you. Right. To a lot more Ghanaians. Right. And Ben, before you let me go, Mm. There was an interesting twist I came across uh, the weekend. Right. Uh, we, we, still, we, still have, we still have a bit of time, though, Duncan. I, okay. I was just sure. wrapping on the daily graphic, not not uh, the, the entire review. But sure. you go ahead. Sure, sure, then. Sure. So I think that the NIA is doing something good. Mm. The service very, very accessible, just like we do for the Electoral Commission ET. Uh, registration cards. You may not be able to open uh, 30,000 centers, but at least do 3,000. Uh, that will give Ghanaians a lot more access uh, in order to get their card. Some of us did a registration, couldn't receive a card. Uh, you go to complain, you are told you probably have to do it all very happy. Uh, with their sets being taken currently. Great. Uh, there was talk sometime last week about the fact that some 88% of those who are uh, who were supposed to be captured in the initial phase had been captured. I've noted churches, even my uh, parish, you know, trying to register people for a fee to aid uh, the NIA. But it still remains that a lot of people, some have even registered, not got their cars yet like you have. But I don't know how interesting this... Right. And I'm just going to run this by you because when you look at two pie charts they have here, in terms of the production of cocoa beans, Africa... Uh, produces 77%. That is by continent. The next highest is the Americas with about 17%. But guess what? When you look at the consumption of chocolate or cocoa products, then Africa is, the, is facing a similar situation. We're being encouraged to consume cocoa. The same cocoa we produce 
yet even a bar of chocolate, how affordable is it? What, what is your quick take on this mismatch or um, uh, very, very worrying development, very startling situation? We produce it and yet... Um, we plan for this country. Right. Um, you don't have much to do with the medium to long-term planning. And so, uh, though we produce, you know, probably the second highest, though we used to be the first, so Ivory Coast overtook uh, Ghana for that right. spot. Um, you ask to mm. also do whatever they want to do with it. And then there's a re export We go back for sometimes the cocoa butter and all of that. I do think that for a country... That has a lot of, you know, advantage, competitive advantage with cocoa. Uh, we could have planned a lot better for this commodity, like the way in And so, like you rightly said, even for Ghanaian, to get a bar of chocolate, you need to cough out almost a dollar, you know, and, and more. But you go out there to Dubai, you would be surprised to realize that it could cost you less to get chocolate to get those small, small bits, you know, that they package six and 12 in boxes, it could cost you less to get a bar of chocolate. Mm. That is a fantastic idea we think should be looked at again because if you inculcate in the young one that habit, they will grow up with it, knowing that at least if I can get a bar a week, you know, it has a certain you know, health benefit. And for those who would also get a bit addicted I mean, that is how you grow a consumption from, you know, scratch. But sadly, people have to pay more for chocolate in this part of the world. And in a country like ours where uh, bread and butter issues come first, uh, they will probably sadly spend the money on, you know, you know hooking our people onto uh, these um, um, chocolate products that uh, we produce here in order that we can also consume what. Uh, we produce. What we produce, yes. right. Let's go to the Ghanaian Times newspaper, page 17 to be specific. We're not returning to classrooms today, uh, UDAG is saying that. And the University Teachers Association of Ghana has categorically mentioned that lecturers will not be returning to the classrooms today, uh, February the 21st. Now, uh, speaking on the forum uh, on Saturday, uh, Professor Solomon Nunu, the president of UDAG, said there would be no teaching uh, on any of the Cabinet Committee on Education to call off the strike and return to the negotiating uh, table. And I quote him, we'll still be on strike this coming Monday and will not be returning to the classroom. When we met Parliament last Thursday, the government gave an indication that they want us to sit and talk about the issue, for which reason we asked for a period so that it gives room for us to talk to the employers. Looks like this, uh, we have you know, a few people who have spoken to you on this uh, strike. Uh, what do you think uh, can be done? I mean, now that all attempts have failed, the court has directed UTAC to go back, but it appears that is going to be another process. Duncan. Well, Ben, part of the very good people I got to wish uh, a happy birthday were members of UTAC. And uh, like Duncan, our incomes cannot take us home. And nothing is being that the only state to pay lip service uh, to the issues, uh, we threaten strike, and then they use the students as a bargaining chip, and then we go back uh, to continue. Uh, they do think that they genuinely deserve a lot better, uh, not getting what they have paid for uh, as far as the semester or the academic year is concerned. Anything that could be done to resolve this should be done. Unfortunately, they are also taking a hard stance now uh, simply because of what they have seen in the past where uh, they raise their issues and concerns and, you know, interventions are made. And then when they return, uh, that's where it ends. Uh, nothing is done about their concerns, their grievances, and, and um, our men and women who devote their time in molding uh, minds for this right. country. If they right. don't exist, I don't think that uh, this country will probably be able to progress. Anything that could be done uh, to end this strike immediately. If we take the president to step in to say, look, uh, what they deserve, 
If it is something we can accommodate immediately, right. I can for them. Right. And show some seriousness. Once you do, they are reasonable people. I'm sure they will go back to the classroom immediately because some of them have even missed their students from what <laughs> I gather with conversations with right. them. Let, let's quickly uh, get into the final newspaper. COVID-19, 15,174 closed businesses reopened thanks to positive impact. That's according to Reverend Intim Fodjo, a Deputy Minister of Education. But how about this one? Your quick reaction to that story on page 9. We have not created a culture of silence for journalists. That's according to Deputy Minister of Information, Ms. Fatimatu Abubakar. Uh, who has debunked claims that journalists are being silenced or muzzled and are wallowing in a culture of silence under the current NPP administration. She said this on World System, while we have outlawed the criminal libel law. Your quick take on that. Looking at recent developments, do you feel there's any muzzling going on? Well, Ben, I do think um, that the state should be a bit flexible uh, in the mumbo-jumbo, you know, bit that has been added. Um, if in your work as a journalist, uh, you report 99% accuracy and 1% you fall off, uh, then we overlook the 99% um, that you have done. And they, the politicians within the active political space, they do these things far more than journalists far more than civil society activists or players. Uh, the kind of things they have said in the past, that if you play to them today, I mean, arrest, is something that ought to be condemned and condemned forthrightly. If a journalist gets a story uh, wrong, you give them the same opportunity uh, to correct the story, not to go for them, lock them, you know, dehumanize them, and make that kind of you know, impunity that the police in recent times uh, has embarked upon become a pick you. Your family might not even see you for a time, so we'll probably decide when they should come and see you. We'll take you to court and say they should remand you. Remand you for speaking, for speaking. This is something that the country should be speaking uh, against because if you, Benjamin, don't wake up 4 a.m. to come and prepare, and provide the kind of essential service you provide to all of us, we will not be informed. You cannot become an in the same opportunity be afforded you to say, okay, look, I couldn't check this well, but I have done this, and this is that. And it ends there. But where the police would now be sent to media houses, uh, lay ambush and pick journalists, I don't think that is the way to go. We need to have a national conversation on this and insist. Forthwith. It is not a very good development for Ghana as far as the human rights uh, uh, index is concerned. Not very good. Let's wrap on two uh, quick points, very quick ones, uh, Duncan. Uh, Alan buys, and I'm talking of Alan Chairman Ting, uh, buys forms for MPP aspiring polling station executives. Uh, they couldn't do so themselves. He did that. It is alleged that uh, uh, someone was assaulted. In fact, people were assaulted. Uh, a member of parliament's uh, friends or cronies, one of them pulled out a gun and all of that. How do you react to all these bits, even as the MPP uh, gets ready to head towards and then the national uh, level? Money in our grassroots politics, as well as this bit about influence. What, what is your quick reaction to that? Well, Ben, this country hardly ever learns anything. As far as I know, Right. Uh, the, the the same shenanigans the games will play. <laughs> NDC will come and have it. The same shenanigans the games will play. Right. Uh, this will beat this. This will fight this. This will throw money and all of that. What would advise the public when they come throwing the to, to to be uh, given? Right. Take the money, but do so in a civil manner. If you don't agree with somebody else, know that the shapes of your head cannot be the same. Mm. So your your brains cannot be working in similar fashion. Uh, these violent, I mean, although isolated, uh, give me any chance on e-levy. And the only quick thing I would say about this is something interesting I came across the weekend that says, look, if we pass e-levy today, just like we have done with Ghana card, suddenly the state will say, oh, even to pay for services for everything, you know, the state provides. 
like you go to the DVLA, go to this, uh, it should be electronic. Right. In order that people can influence, in, in just taking from the people sometimes, uh, without proper accountability, what right. Ghanaians are asking is that what we contribute already, put it to good use and come back for more. That okay. we think uh, should be the way forward. And that argument of a lot of Ghanaians not paying taxes, it's right. a fallacy that should be debunked. Every Ghanaian, you wake up in the morning, find those small, yeah. small tickets from GRE. Yeah. You are paying. Yeah. People are paying taxes. Well, Unfortunately, good. the direct ones may be a bit small because we are not creating as many jobs mm. and people are not as many in formal employment. If you yeah. need the indirect taxes, go to the informal sector and get people registered. The artists are paying taxes. Target okay. the artisans, the good. informal sector. I, I feel and get your a little point more is... Then. And you're harping on that because I know uh, you feel passionately about uh, that subject. But thank you. Uh, this is where we draw the curtains on this engagement. Dun uh, Duncan, have a good day. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Man. Right. So, Kumasi Asante Kotoko. And, of course, uh, in the English Premiership, uh, sides like Manchester City slipping to Tottenham. We'll bring you all those details with Muftar Nabila Abdullah. He's up next.